So in January and February, uh, 1857 now, the court is adjudicating or discussing this, and from correspondence and other things, we kind of know what happened. First of all, there were three issues in this case, three issues before the court, okay? One, was there a case at all? Was Dred Scott a citizen of the United States? Could he sue in federal court? There were some people who said, no, no, a black person cannot be a citizen, and therefore Dred Scott, there's no case. Just throw it out of court. There's no case here because Dred Scott can't sue. That's one issue. Can he or can he, can he not? Two, obviously, is he free? <laughs> Did residents on free soil make him free or not? since he voluntarily went back, it seems, to Missouri. Um, and finally, did Congress have the right? Everyone knows that a state had the right. Illinois had the right to bar slavery. No one doubts that. Did Congress have the right to prohibit slavery in the Missouri Compromise in that large Western territory? So when the court met, uh, as always happens, some of the justices wanted to deal with this on a very narrow sort of technical ground, you know? You could just throw out the case on various grounds and that'd be the end of that. But there were others who wanted to make a much more sweeping uh, decision. And um, Tawney was one of them. Tawney had this idea that the court could solve the, pro you know, here's the Supreme Court is being given the opportunity to solve the slavery issue solve the sectional issue, so let's do it. Let's do it here, let's, let's, let's take the bull by the horns. Um, and so very quickly, Tawney and the four Southerners decided to issue a broad decision which would include declaring the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. Now the Missouri Compromise had already been repealed, remember, in 1854 in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, but by declaring it unconstitutional, you would be saying that Congress can never prohibit slavery in any territory in the future. It's not just this old law that they don't have the right to do that. So, but Tawney kind of realized that you can't have a five to four decision with all the five representatives coming from slave states and all the four who are against the decision coming from free states, that would not look very good. That would not look like a legitimate decision. It would simply look like five pro-slavery people out voting for. It wouldn't have any legitimacy in the North. So um, one of the justices, the one, uh, one of the justices wrote to President Buchanan, in, or President-elect, I should say, Buchanan, in, in February 1857, saying, uh, we're moving toward this case, but it would be really good if we could get a Northerner on our side. Why don't you get in touch with Justice Greer of Pennsylvania. Buchanan knew him from Pennsylvania. We have a Pennsylvania, why don't we try to get him to vote with the Southerners? And Buchanan did this. This is irregular, to say the least, although hardly unknown. Presidents have interfered in Supreme Court decisions. Subsequently, President Roosevelt was in communication with uh, Louis Brandeis uh, quite a few times. President um, uh, Johnson used to do that now. So in other words, it's known. But nonetheless, it's still irregular. Um, but, um, and then when in his inaugural address, March 4th, 1857, Buchanan says, I understand that the Supreme Court is about to issue a ruling in this famous case. And what, I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know what the ruling is, although he already did know what it was going to be. Uh, but I, we should all abide by it. You know, the court is going to adjudicate this matter, and everybody has to go along with what the court, which should abide by what the court decides. So, and then a few days later, the Dred Scott decision is issued. So what was the Dred Scott decision? That's not an entirely easy question to answer because the most famous part of the Dred Scott decision is what we call obiter dicta. That is to say, it's just Tawny yakking on. That's, a, that's not a legal phrase, but... Um, you know, it's, Tawny, it's a, an opinion by Tawney, which is actually not the decision of the court. It's in his opinion. And there were varying votes on various questions. There's not just one single Dred Scott decision. But um, nonetheless, here's what was decided by various majorities. Number one, was Dred Scott a citizen who could sue in federal court? And of course, this is the most famous part of the case. Tawney said, no, no. 
the Constitution is only for white people. The Founding Fathers felt, and this is the most famous or infamous sentence in the Dred Scott decision, the Founding Fathers felt that the black man has no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Okay? The, the black man has no rights which the, black, the white... By the way, there are some excerpts in the Janap book. You can see all the, how this is all put out. But all right. Um, no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Later on, uh, Thaddeus Stevens would say in Congress, this sentence damned Tawney to everlasting fame and I fear everlasting fire. He would go to hell because of this infamous statement. Um, now, the, f the fact is that citizenship was very vaguely defined at the time. There was no real legal definition of who was an American citizen. Today, there is a clear definition. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution tells you who is an American citizen. Anybody born in the United States or who goes through the naturalization process. But there was no such law. The Constitution talks about the privileges and immunities of citizens, but it neither tells you what those privileges and immunities are or who the citizens are. Otherwise, it's quite clear. Um, Tawney admitted that a state could make a black person a citizen, as Massachusetts did. Massachusetts recognized black people as citizens. Blacks could vote in Massachusetts. They could do whatever else citizens might want to do in Massachusetts. But that didn't mean the nation had to recognize them. The nation, he says, is a family, a white family. And no state can introduce a new member into this family. Um, and therefore, among other things, the comity clause of the Constitution does not apply to black people. That's a very important thing. In other words, the comedy clause says that the states have to recognize as citizens the citizens of other states. In other words, if you move from New York to Illinois, they can't discriminate against you because you come from New York, right? You got to enjoy the same rights as people from Illinois. The states cannot differentiate among people from different states. But States did differentiate about blacks. There were states that prohibited black people from entering the state. By the way, in the North, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas had laws making it illegal for a black person to enter the state. How can you do that if they're citizens? Well, Tony said they're not citizens, so no problem. Um, the comedy clause doesn't apply to them. Um, there were precedents, but they were kind of vague. There were cases where um, th this had been discussed in the past. There were some federal administrations had recognized blacks as citizens, some had not. Most had not. Black people were not issued passports, for example, if they wanted to travel. However, back then, you didn't need a passport to travel. Most people didn't have a passport when they traveled. So not having a passport wasn't that big a deal, actually. Nonetheless, but here's the real question. This statement of Tawney is an exercise in what nowadays they call original intent, right? Tawney is not saying, I don't, this maybe is getting a bum rap here. He didn't say, I don't believe a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. He said, I actually don't have much prejudice. I'm, but we are bound by the views of the founders. The founders, he says, the founders, the people who wrote the Constitution, did not believe that a black person had any rights. Not me. I'm, we're, we've moved on. But we got to go with what the founders put into the Constitution. That's original intent. You hear that frequently from some members of the, you know, Scalia, others. That's their, you know, this originalism doctrine. So this is an exercise in that, and it's a rather telling indictment, if it's true, of the uh, founding of this nation and a, and a, uh, a kind of a casting a bright light on the contradiction of the American Revolution, where people created a constitution to secure the blessings of liberty, and yet, if Tawney is right, they didn't believe black people should have any of those rights. Um, the Dred Scott decision makes the 14th Amendment necessary after the Civil War in order to establish beyond all doubt in the Constitution, 
the citizenship of African American people in this country. Um, is it true? Is this a good reading? I, I don't know. You know, I'm sure there are many founders who didn't really believe blacks are part of the body politic, but there were many who did. African American men could vote in most of the states at the time the Constitution was ratified. African American men voted to elect delegates to the conventions that ratified the Constitution. So how can you say they weren't citizens if they're actually part of the ratification process of this very uh, document? But anyway, only two other justices touched on this issue at all. So that wasn't really a decision of the Supreme Court. It was just a statement by the, by the Chief Justice, but it became the most famous element. Most of the justices avoided it altogether because you could, if, if that was the case, then, there's no, then you don't have to go on. That's the end of the case. There's no case. Why have an opinion on anything else if Dred Scott can't even sue? But of course, they did go on.